Um, so in the interest of time, I better move on to our next speaker. So thanks again, Carol Thank and you. Mary Jane. And I'd like to introduce Ashling Gerrithy. So Ashling is from the School of Public Health in UCD and also the University of Melbourne uh, Department of Pediatrics. So I'll hand over to you now, Ashling. Okay, thanks so much, Afrik. I'll just share my screen. Yeah, so hopefully everyone should be able to see that okay. Um, thank you so much. And it's really great to um, be here today, to share some of the findings and also to hear all the great presentations um, from earlier this morning as well. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Ashling. Um, I'm a researcher in the UCD School of Public Health. Um, and up until September, I was working as a project manager in the University of Melbourne. And so I'm gonna to continue to collaborate with the team there. And this morning, I'm gonna share some of the results from the COVID-19 um, survey we were working on during that time. So I know we've been talking a lot of, uh, um, this morning about the, um, I suppose, COVID-19 in Ireland and also in Germany. Um, but just to kind of set the scene in Australia, they've just, this is just from this morning, actually, they just um, passed 28,000 cases and the majority of um, pat uh, patients with COVID-19 are recovered by now. Um, so they've done relatively well, comparably well to other places. Um, the first case of COVID-19 was detected at the end of January, um, but it was comparably quite well managed. There was a relatively small I suppose, wave um, in May, or sorry, in March, um, but it kind of came down quite quickly. And then I suppose, the second slightly larger wave was in um, July, kind of August, September, um, and different I suppose, associated restrictions with that. Um, not all of Australia was impacted equally. Um, when we look at Australia here, all the different states, it was primarily Victoria that was um, quite worse hit in terms of an outbreak of COVID-19. So it was 75% of all cases, 20 out of the 28,000 um, of COVID-19 cases were in Victoria. So just to give a brief overview of the restrictions, sort of lockdowns, um, most of which impacted Victoria, they were very similar to those seen across the world. Um, in March, it started um, with the first, I suppose the main restriction um, was that Australia shut their borders from the 20th of March. So no international travel um, and then very strict quarantine for anybody, any citizens or residents returning to Australia. So that quite quickly brought down um, the cases, but then unfortunately, uh, kind of starting off in June and uh, mid June, there was a, um, another outbreak in the state of Victoria. So. Um, that brought quite very strict restrictions as well, not too dissimilar to what we had over in Ireland over the last um, couple of weeks. Um, kind of from end June, July, they brought in very strict um, lockdowns, sort of ba first based on postcodes in July, um, but then a full lockdown was brought into the greater Melbourne area. So Melbourne is the biggest city in Victoria, um, and that was a full lockdown, uh, which lasted up until September. So that was sort of in, across their winter in Australia. They're just coming out of that now um, and going back into the summertime as well. So the project that I was working on is based in, um, in around Victoria and um, around Melbourne. So it's the Australian uh, Temperament Project. So this is one of the longest running studies of social and emotional development in Australia. It's based on a representative sample of over 2000 Australian children who were born in the state of Victoria between September uh, 1982 and January 1983. So it's been running for the last 37 years. Um, it followed up the parents, um, that was generation one, and then their offspring who were born uh, during that time were the generation two. And they've been followed for the last 37 years with 16 waves of data collection all across childhood, adolescence, and then into adult life. And then the ATP generation three study, um, that builds on the foundations of the ATP and it was started in 2012. So they recruited expectant Gen 2 mothers and fathers um, and then recruited their offspring. So there was over a thousand cohort offspring um, that were followed up from late pregnancy up till four years of data collection. So that was five waves. Um, but we've recently just got funding for an eight-year-old follow-up as well. So that'll be starting next year. So it's, a, it's an intergenerational study. We have grandparents, parents, and then also um, young children as well. So there's a link to the website if anyone's interested and um, to find out a bit more. I won't spend too long on this, but basically it covers a lot of different um, measurement domains all across social and emotional um, health, well-being, development. The ATP Gen 3 project, it focuses on building on different knowledge of, I suppose, what had been collected in the previous studies, um, looking at parent, grandparent, emotional health, 
So this detailed data collection on early development of the offspring behaviors, that's in the term of internalizing behaviors, externalizing and different socioeconomic competencies, and also looks at other factors um, that influence development. So that includes the school environment, family and uh, neighborhood environment, and then also socioeconomic factors and social disadvantages and inequities as well. So we felt that when the pandemic hit, really this study was ideally placed to shine a light on the kind of short term, but also long term impacts of this pandemic and the resulting lockdowns um, and restrictions with it. So in terms of mental health impacts on relationships with family, friends, um, education, financial strains that can come with it. Um, and we also hope to look at kind of pre-existing patterns of risk and resilience that could predict how equally children, young people and their families as well adapt to a pandemic. So that was the reasoning behind the HV and Gen 3 COVID wellbeing study. So just to describe the study design, so we're building on the data that was collected, which we're um, referring to as pre-existing social determinants and um, in terms of mental health problems, substance use, relationship factors as well. And then that's where the COVID-19 data collection fit in. So this is the third generation of families and um, the children are aged, it's actually below one um, up to eight years of age. This is the wave one um, data was collected between May and September of this year. So it was a web survey, just an online survey using REDCap. Um, and it was looking at the short term impacts and disruptions of the pandemic and how it influenced um, the family and the children. And then we're hoping to do a second wave of data collection early next year and um, to look at the long term impacts and disruptions of um, the pandemic as it continues. So we've had a 90 or seven, sorry, 73% response rate. This is from the parents that completed the surveys, all parents completed the surveys on behalf of the children. Um, so this analysis, I'm gonna show you just some of the preliminary findings and um, relates to almost 900 children. So there was a different kind of instrumentation. We did a lot of discussion, although we wanted to get it out very quickly and trying to decide this was the most appropriate questionnaires to use. So. We tried where possible to get our questions from the coronavirus health impact survey um, called crisis it's a version three it's a combination of adult self-report and also parent caregiver forms and um, the idea was that we can have this data collection that questionnaire was designed in the uk so we wanted to make sure that our data was comparable as possible and um, to different sites so it looks at covid 19 exposures emotional well-being of the parent and the child substance use and um, different online learning um, and the adjustment to that relationships, financial security, and then other kind of behaviors as well. So I'm just going to show you kind of the um, descriptives of that analysis. So, and um, this is just very simple. It was just an online survey. They could do it on their phone or their uh, laptop, whatever is easiest, just very um, simple questions asking about the previous two weeks, how your child was feeling. So this was across May to September, but primarily most of them completed it during that major lockdown um, around Victoria. So just some of the descriptors of the mental health findings, this refers to the parents. Um, we had about a third of parents that reported very or extremely high levels of anxiety, sadness, fatigue, and loss of enjoyment during this time. Um, about one in 10 parents that reported similarly high levels of feeling irritable, restless, lonely, and then also being worried about um, infection rates as well. And then about one in 20 parents for kind of other symptoms too. Um, there was no positive COVID-19 tests reported in any of the families, um, only sort of distant relatives, but none in the actual households themselves. But one in four um, reported that either themselves or one of their family members within their household um, needed to attend a doctor or emergency department or were hospitalized. High rates of self-quarantine that was with symptoms or without symptoms, um, it was quite strict. Um, and then also it was one in four reporting reduced ability to earn money or else um, end up losing their job during that time. So that can all influence the family as well. In terms of other difficulties, there was one in four reported very high levels of alcohol use. Um, and then it ranged from one to 10% of parents reporting high use of tobacco, um, cannabis, and then other illicit or prescription drugs. Um, and we're gonna compare that back to pre-pandemic levels too. Uh, it was less than 10% reporting financial difficulties. So, um, Thankfully, it wasn't very high rates. Um, and then about one in four percent were reporting significant difficulties um, in terms of relationships with either partners in the household um, or else significant difficulties with friends. Um, but it was less than 10 percent of parents that reported problems with their relationships with their own children. It was slightly higher for parents of um, pre or primary school age children, so older, but 
and um, still below the 10 percent. So then when we looked at the mental health difficulties for the children, um, we found that there was about 30 percent parents reported that children had very high distress levels on two or more of the indicators on the scales that we used. So about 30 percent overall, but when we split these out, it's around 28 percent had high levels of irritability, um, about one in four feeling restless and then lower down for feeling fatigued or lonely during that time as well. Um, but this differed with age. So um, the distress levels were higher for uh, primary school age children. So it was up to 35% reporting kind of distress on two or more indicators. Um, it was one in three um, primary school children. So that was kind of over the age of five, so five to eight, that felt irritable. And then twice as many primary school children felt lonely um, and unfocused during the lockdown as well. So if we're looking at how, what this cohort would have been uh, doing before the pandemic, um, during this time, the vast majority of them moved to online learning or else home and looking after at home. So about 10% would have normally had no childcare. So there was no uh, big change to that. Oh, sorry. Um, and about 40% would have been in a crash or a preschool, but then moved to being at home. And then about half were attending a primary school. And most of those also moved to online learning. So as Ludger mentioned earlier in his presentation, um, we were talking about there was a lot of challenges with home learning. We asked parents just quite simply how much was their child enjoying or engaging with online learning activities. I suppose similarly as well, parents reported about half of the children were either almost always or engaging well. So this is um, this was about 450 children aged from five to eight. Um, so it was about a third of children sometimes engaging and then about 15% rarely or never. Um, and then we also split looking at so gender identity as well. And then for the children identifying as female, it was higher. So they engaged better and they reported kind of enjoying more um, with online learning activities. So it was 57% um, compared to just 46% of males. Um, and then for those rarely or never, rates were higher um, for males as well in terms of not enjoying or engaging as well with the online learning. So that was an important finding as well. And when we looked at um, parents balancing work because parents moved to working from home, similar to across the world, um, and also to balance childcare, it was 37% of parents found it difficult to balance this, and this increased with the age of the child. So while it was about one in four finding it difficult if their child was, would have been in a crash or daycare, it increased up to nearly half of parents reported finding it very difficult to balance their own work, uh, workload with childcare as well, um, if their, ch their child is usually in primary school. Um, we also thought it would be interesting to look at mothers and fathers reporting this difference and it really did appear that mothers were shouldering the burden maybe a little bit more of balancing work and childcare so it was almost half of mothers always or often find it difficult to balance and um, their own work with childcare compared to just 30 percent of fathers um, it was only 20 percent of mothers either rarely or never found it difficult compared to almost twice that of fathers who felt there was no real impact of that on their work um, just really briefly, I won't spend too much time, but we did do some qualitative feedback as well. We were interested in kind of identifying not so much just, just positives, but also or just negatives, really the positives as well, sometimes of the lockdown. So the main negatives that parents identified from the lockdown and restrictions was the negative impact on their child development, which is uh, to be expected, the difficulties balancing work and childcare at home. And then also parents miss or children missing their grandparents specifically and um, family members more so than friends we actually found it for those aged under eight because they would have been used to seeing them um, as well but then just in terms of positives there were more family time um, and some parents reported a greater understanding of child academic level because they got to see the schooling going on at home and there was a little bit of reduced pressure and stress so so because the outbreak wasn't as strong um, at the time in Australia, maybe worries were a little bit lower, but that was just what we found. So we're hoping to have um, write up that analysis pretty soon. Um, just really quick, um, we're, this is just a preliminary data of the descriptives. We're hoping to use this analysis to try and look at intergenerational impacts of mental health and substance use, economic inequalities, um, how these will predict how well a family and, and children adapt to a pandemic in this sort of environment. Um, we're going, we want to use different ways of data collection to try and identify those that maybe adapt well and stay well or started well and then start to struggle or else strengthened as the pandemic goes on, just try and identify what factors um, influence that. And when we talk about waves of, um, I suppose there's also a wave of health footprint of the pandemic, so we're hoping to look at the different impacts of this pandemic in terms of um, 
how it's influencing children and adolescents going forward with this analysis um, as well. So just to acknowledge and just thank um, my team, this is just a screenshot from, I suppose, everyone's usual meetings now with their own team. Um, thanks to Craig and Primrose who lead the project, who've been great, especially with me in Ireland managing the project from here. Um, and then also to the data collection management teams who've done a great job. Um, the participants themselves who've been fantastic and then the funding bodies as well. So thanks very much. That's brilliant, Ashley. Thanks very much. Again, really interesting uh, study. What amazing data to have. Um, just I, you, you probably haven't gotten to it yet, based on what you said there in the last slide. But do you have the metrics, like similar metrics from before COVID, to be able to directly compare? So I suppose particularly that thirty percent reporting in that kind of very high category. Um, would you have? Kind of similar questions and so that you can make that kind of direct comparison back when you do get the opportunity to do it yeah we tried that was part of the challenge in picking a suitable questionnaire in terms of what metrics we could compare across so we did sort of go with the crisis questionnaire so it's slightly different in terms that it asks over the last two weeks how they were feeling but we're going to use sort of mental health measures and competencies over the last couple of years to try and match them up as appropriately as we can. So they won't be direct measures of how they were feeling, but it'll be similar to kind of look at risk impacts and things like that. So that's that's the plan for the analysis. And then is there is there a plan to follow up on the kind of COVID specific questions? Um, as I suppose, hopefully the trajectory of COVID cases starts to drop and things start to open up or maybe after vaccine mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah, we've been sort of adapting the design as it goes. I mean, the outbreak we were sort of expecting maybe to be a little bit worse at the time in Australia, but in the end, then the wave was a bit later. So we ended up stretching out the data collection wave to increase, I suppose, answers and participation. So the idea was to do um, data collection in earlier on and then one later in the year, but we've pushed it to next year now. Um, the current plan is at maybe three waves. So around the same time, maybe next year, around March next year, and then maybe the same time later in the year with the exact same questions to look at that. Um, so that's the plan, just to compare them across. Brilliant. Okay, thanks a million, um, Ashley.